This is an excerpt from a full interview with Professor Marion McCurdy, the great-granddaughter of Aaron Sachaklian, who was one of the masterminds of Operation Nemesis. If you don't know what Operation Nemesis is, I don't even know why you're watching this channel. Go figure it out and then come back and watch this. But we got a full interview with her. This excerpt, she explains what a bunch of badasses these guys were. Um, I'll just watch it. But don't forget to subscribe and share and click the notification bell. Perhaps as a way to connect the, you know, something from the relatively recent past to today, namely what is going on in Nagorno-Karabakh, I thought I would bring up this very interesting video which was circulating online a few weeks ago, and I believe even Michael edited and added it as one of the, the videos on our channel, where it shows a young Armenian soldier singing the song called Gini Litz, which in Armenia, of course, means, you know, poor wine. And it's about Solomon Tillian's assassination of Talat Pasha. And I think the question I wanted to ask was, why do you think Tillian's story continues to resonate to this day, especially among Armenians? I'm sure his story, you know, stripped of some of its context can uh, allow one to relate to it no matter what background they come from. But especially for Armenians, you still see this very strong imagery that is connected to him. This project is so improbable. I mean, think about it. It's so improbable. How could you even imagine that they could have been so successful? These guys were good. They tracked on, uh, like tracking down, you know, a, a muskrat, you know? They figured out what he smelled like. They figured out where he was gonna go. These guys did a great job. So on the one hand, you know, you, you have to you have to, to to bow to excellence right you have to bow to talent you have to bow to, to determination you have to bow to the intelligence needed to get this thing done so that's part of it but also part of it is that by, by the, the improbable piece is you know the, the, talk about coming from behind um they had nothing going for them nothing except their hearts and souls and spirits they didn't have much money they collected the money for, from people who had almost no money. I still don't understand how they did that. I don't understand it at all, but they did. What they also did do was they were careful. They didn't overplay their hands. They didn't do more than they could do. And they also were very careful in how they handled the trial. And this is, this is really important because they had to do a whole a bunch of things in this trial to get this trial right. First of all, they had to make known the plight of the Armenians in the world. They had to. They had to make it very clear to everybody how terrible their situation was. Second thing, they had to justify the acts of the Avengers. They had to say, you would have done the same thing in our shoes. You can understand why we did this. Even if you couldn't be on our shoes, you, could, you can understand it. And three, they had to raise money, tons of it, and they did. They raised money from the sales of the transcripts to both support both the Armenians in, the, in dire need and the work of the ARF. So they were able to create for themselves a narrative of this man that was the truth, even though it wasn't all the truth, right? I mean, he did not see his mother murdered, right? But did it matter? He did, it didn't matter at all, ultimately, because his mother's still dead. His sister was still dead, and they died horribly. That's the truth. Yeah. So, I, I, don't, I don't think he had any sisters. It's just uh, oh, wait, three, it, I thought, three, three, three brothers. brothers right? I, I, I meant that. I'm, it, you're right. It's a brother. It's a brother. Yeah. I'm thinking of, um, he, yeah, there's another one that has a sister. Okay, so. Um, but he, he did testify about seeing his sister killed so well, he did that was in the transcript it yeah, was in the so transcript. that's one of the one of the falsehoods that you're talking about that's yeah. right that's right that's right but he did lose his family um and uh, and a lot so did a lot of other people i mean Armand Garo lost everybody but one brother and um when he was trying to recover he went to his brother's mill and he worked basically hours and hours and hours and hours a day so that he was able to finally come back 
but he never totally did. I mean, he, he died in 1923 of a heart, heart problem. Um, he died of a broken heart. He did. So this project did not save him. Um, but I think it gave a lot of Armenians some hope, hope that they were, they would be able to at least hold their heads up then. I mean, it, it, it's a very difficult, excruciatingly painful thing to imagine everything you've ever cared about blown to bits and you couldn't lift a finger, couldn't do anything. You know, I, I, I don't wanna shock your, your audience here by giving images, but there are tons of them out there if you, if you look. And the deaths that these people suffered were unspeakable, just put it that way. That's why I'm not giving you the details right now. They were unspeakable. The details are, are part of what these people saw in their mind's eyes as they were thinking about remembering their families. So it's understandable um, why they did this. But geopolitical realities shifted and they shifted enough. So the Bureau said, gotta stop doing this. It's not gonna help us any, the, the Turks are too powerful. And so, and, and the United States is, is not gonna be behind us now. They saw the handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting on the wall happened when Lausanne, the, the Treaty of Sevres was replaced. So yeah. by Lausanne. Yeah, I just, just one other point to add to that. And this is just taking a look at these guys from a demographic profile. And what you mentioned about Shahan Natali, about how he was a graduate from Boston University. And even somebody like Solomon Tellerian, who had not received a education at the, you know, at the university level uh, by the time that he enrolled in the Russian army and was serving on the front. And ultimately he got himself mixed up with these guys from Operation Nemesis. But this was a man who at the time was only, was it four plus 14, only 18 years old when he decided to serve in the, the First World War and go through that experience over the next six years of his life. It's quite a, a formative, or it would have quite a formative impact on somebody so young and to, to witness all that. And in an age where you know the world was changing with different types of technology, and of course the First World War just being a, uh, you know, a complete game changer when it came to how wars would be fought and what sort of treatment civilians would be subjected to both in the Ottoman Empire, among Belgian civilians or French civilians who came under German occupation or Russian civilians who came under German or Austro-Hungarian occupation. So again, just interesting to, to take in and uh, just as a to pause for a moment and absorb, you know, allow me to absorb it. Uh, those were the questions I had, Michael, uh, with the exception of the one about movie recommendations, but I thought I would leave that one to you. I would just want to add, thing, add one thing about um, Edmund Gatto. Um, he, he was a very smart man. I mean, he was educated. He had a doctoral degree um, in, in um, physics and chemistry, I think. And um, his, I think ultimately, it, you, you know, you do your best, you do what you can do, but um, Elise's mother, or Aaron's wife's father, died of, of, of a heart attack when his son was imprisoned. Um, he was ultimately released and he didn't die for a few more years, but, but he was heartbroken that his son might be hanged for um, trying to protect his family in Dorgio in 1909. He was not, he was shot to death by the Turks in, in Eintop, fighting them. And that was probably a better death on his end. I'm sure he felt it was because he, he chose to fight. But the fact is that you have to hold on to this. I mean, if you're asking the question, why did they do this? You just have to remember the losses and what those losses were like for these people. And, and the responsibility that was shirked by the Western powers. That's the piece that I think we have to remember and we choose not to too often, um, including the United States. 
the United States does not follow through on its responsibilities when it should. That was one example, but there are many others as well.